Well, good morning, everyone. Um, this is going to be a, a shortened version of our service today because we had some issues with our live stream sound. It was not coming through. We haven't had that issue as of yet, so we're not sure what was wrong, but Johnny and I are going to do some work this week and um, researching and talking with some folks to try to get that uh, up and running. So our apologies for that, but uh, wanted to be able to, to post and share uh, some of our service um, today. So welcome. Our reading was from John's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down their life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the creator knows me and I know the creator. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Creator loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from the Creator. For the Word of God in Scripture, for the Word of God among us, for the Word of God within us, thanks be to God. So friends, in the just most recent news this past couple weeks, Dante Wright, and Adam Toledo, among many others, before and God forbid more after, Young people of color killed by police. Dante Wright, 20. Adam Toledo, 13. These are just kids. My God, this cannot be acceptable. This cannot just be collateral damage or the actions of a few bad apples. As many have been saying for some time now, this is about a system and not just individuals. Amid these tragedies, the shocking reality that finally, in one instance of many instances, a police officer was held accountable by a jury for the murder of George Floyd. Many of us were surprised. The fact that we were surprised shines a light on just how messed up policing and the criminal justice system are. This was not justice. It's accountability. Justice would have been George Floyd's family having him back, him still having breath. But this accountability is good and it is right, but there's so much further to go. The families of Dante and Adam will not get justice either, but hopefully they will get accountability. Perhaps of all the infuriating things I saw this week was news and social media posts that basically were saying about Dante Wright's killing, it's simple. Do not resist arrest, then you will not die. If you do resist arrest, then you will die. So flippant, so disregarding of the humanity of others. I can't use the language that wells up in me when I hear that sentiment because, well, I am in church and this is on YouTube. But that statement is the biggest load of you-know-what I've ever heard or seen. It disgusts me and it angers me and I have to be careful because it makes me want to treat those who say it, say it in, in the same inhumane way that they're treating the victims of this senseless violence. I have to break the cycle of violence in myself. We have to break that cycle and we have to break it in our systems. During this Easter season, we're talking about rolling the stone away and stepping into more liberation, more freedom, more love, and less fear. It's hard enough to figure out how to do that in our own personal lives. It's even harder to figure out how to do that systemically 
and as a society, how to create a world where people of color are not afraid to emerge and go about their daily lives, or even, God forbid, make a mistake or a bad choice and not end up dying at the hands of someone whose job it is to serve and protect them. So into our collective narrative and journey come these words from Jesus, from John's Gospel about the Good Shepherd. First, we must note that this story and its imagery would resonate deeply with the audience's understanding of the Hebrew story and literature. The Psalms use the image of a shepherd to describe the divine. Many of their most revered ancestors were shepherds, Moses, David, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Shepherds was, a shepherd was an ancient way of describing the leadership of a human or a divine leader, often comparing and contrasting them. And structurally, this story has a unifying opening statement, which gives us our image. I am the good shepherd. The word good is kalos in Greek, which would mean model. I am the model shepherd. This is how it's done, so to speak. And then comes a description and explanation, explanation of the model shepherd with three repetitions of this statement. I lay down my life for the sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. Structurally, this story has, is, a, is a powerful one and one that, as I said, would have spoken to others. And, and this story is also a, a powerful story about freedom and liberation. Jesus says, I lay down my li life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. I think this is a profound picture of liberation and freedom and love, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. So you know what I think? I think that if you are a police officer or really any person in authority, particularly an authority that gives you the means and permission to take a life, someone who might say, carry a deadly weapon. If that is you, well then, you have to be a good shepherd. You have to be a good shepherd, period, and end of story. And in fact, the problem with policing in America and a lot of other things is, that, is how they understand themselves in their role. You exist to serve and protect like a shepherd. You must know and value those sheep, those beings you have been given care of, like they're the most precious things to you. You must believe their life and well-being is important, is as important or more important than your own. You have to believe, even if they stray, that they are not worthy to be lost, but that you'll go through hell and high water to find them and bring them back. Because that is what a good shepherd is. That is what a good shepherd does. That is what a good human is. That should be what policing looks like in America or anywhere else. If you cannot do that, then you should not have a gun. You should not be a police officer. You should not be in a place of authority. You must be willing to lay down your life for them, not have them lay down their life for you. See, we've got it all wrong. We often shy away from the idea of Jesus laying down his life for us. And I agree that we should shy away from that narrative as it's understood as a parent to God in the sky sending his child Jesus to pay a blood sacrifice, to pay for the cost of our sin, to again make us lovable to God. I'm not sure that's how it works. I don't think that's how it works. But Jesus did lay down his life for us. I believe that. And the way he did is exactly what I hope we will see in the life of George Floyd that was laid down, or Dante Wright, or Breonna Taylor, or Manny Ellis, or Adam Toledo. Completely innocent, imperfect or not, yet another senseless death, the kind that Jesus came to point us away from in his own death. But we miss it. The whole point of Jesus' death is to reveal, like these deaths are now revealing and motivating action and calls for change, they both shine a light on what happens when we dehumanize and forget the worth of every person. 
when we are corrupted by all the things that dehumanize and separate us, race, gender, class, sexual orientation, and so forth. When we dehumanize the other, what we get is death. Senseless death and violence over and over again. What we get in those statements that anger me so, the, that criminals are getting what come to them, or that if you resist, that's what's going to happen. It's so flippant. Total and complete disregard and blindness to see the sacredness, the imago Dei, the image of God in those people and those children with black and brown skin tones. You know what resurrection teaches us? particularly the story of Jesus' resurrection, but I imagine many of our own stories that we've lived as well. It teaches us that there is freedom and liberation and more love and less fear when you believe someone else's life is more or at least just as sacred as your own. There is liberation when we walk in the world as a good shepherd and know those given into our care and search after them no matter what when they are lost, and when we're willing to lay down our life for them. I think that's what Jesus means when he says, if you want to save your life, then you have to lose it. Now, I'm not saying that your happiness, my happiness, our happiness, or comfort, or very life, is not just as important. But the counterintuitive way into this fullness this freedom, this liberation, this love is about living for and on behalf of others. Not being constantly trapped in our own survival and fulfillment, but rather really believing that ours is tied to others and to, together in that way we'll do more than just survive, but we can thrive. It's true, we have some bad apples. We have a lot of people in positions of authority, people serving as shepherds who are not good shepherds. They are not model shepherds. They do not truly know or care to know those given into their care. They run or self-protect at first sight of danger. They abandon some just as collateral damage. See some as just dispensable. They do not hold the reverence of others humanity and value the same or more than their own. They are not willing to lay down their lives for those in their care. But we also have systems that are not built on the idea or the ideals of a good shepherd. A system that creates bad apples or bad shepherds. A system that does not hold a cannibal because it's based on a different set of values. Systems will produce the actions, norms, and behaviors that it's built upon. And if you want to talk about policing in general in the U.S., just read your history and you will understand how flawed the underlying assumptions are of our policing, how racist, how it's always been set up to protect a few and never the most vulnerable. So friends, in closing, I return one last time to Jesus' words, his final words from our passage today. I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. These have always been such powerful words to me. Certainly they support what we've been talking about this morning. I lay down my life in order to take it up again. If you want to save your life, you must lose it. We heard Jesus say that somewhere else. The key to freedom and liberation and more love and less fear has something to do with living for and on behalf of one another. A life primarily grounded in self-preservation will never be truly a full life. But I'm also struck by the theme of agency in this passage. Jesus talks about, I have the power to lay it down. I do so of my own accord. I give my life, it is not taken. I have the power to take it up again. In being students of the great teacher Jesus, we're called to engage our, to engage our own agency and to recognize it. 
Sometimes that's really hard, especially in the face of circumstances and situations that feel overwhelming. You know what happens to me in that fear that I've talked about and told you about? I get paralyzed. I lose my agency. I simply let things happen to me and around me. Become like that deer in the headlights sort of thing. But Jesus calls us to an active, an active surrender, an active agency. It has nothing to do with just letting things happen. It's an active living out or pouring out or laying down of our lives for each other, for one another. It's something we choose of our own accord. And when we do, we find that we're also taking up our life in a new way, a better life and a fuller life. Each and every one of us has those that have been given into our care, our partners and children, and later in life, our parents, as that role reversal happens. For some of us, we are, have employees or those we supervise at work. Our friends, our godchildren, our nieces and nephews, our grandkids. Perhaps we coach, teach, or mentor others. Perhaps we are a deacon in this very church. And being a church together means that we are in the care of one another. But we also have to ask ourselves about other people's children, like the ones whose lives were taken in the past couple of weeks and the many before under similar circumstances. Are they our children too? Are they a part of what has been given for us to care for? Are our systems like policing and justice system, are they not also in some way our responsibility even though we're not a cop or a judge or a lawyer? Well, you can probably guess that for me that's a rhetorical question. Yes, yes they are. They are given into our care. And we are all called to be good shepherds. And we must care and act to make sure everyone anyone with that kind of power and responsibility is also a good shepherd because our lives literally depend on it. Lives literally depend on it. So the invitation, friends, is to roll the stone away. The more liberation, more love, more freedom, less fear, and part of that is to know, just as the Good Shepherd is a Good Shepherd to us, is to know those given into our care, to be Good Shepherds ourselves, to be willing to lay down our lives so that we can pick it up again in a different and a better way, to know that we are called to care for others like the Good Shepherd. And that in that, there is greater fullness of life. May it be so. Amen. Well, friends, again, uh, a few quick announcements. One, um, just that uh, we have these worship task force um, focus group listening session kind of meetings. We've had a few of them already, and we've got one this Thursday that you can sign up for. So if you haven't participated yet, please sign up and come and join us for that. That'll be via Zoom, and we may add one more afterwards. We're not quite sure yet. We'll kind of see what kind of numbers we get. I'll also remind you that this next week um, is uh, we will be worshiping on Sunday via Zoom next Sunday at 1030 a.m., so that we can all worship together. So until we're all back to kind of critical mass in here, we'll continue to do our first Sunday of the month by Zoom so we can all have communion together and all be together. And then immediately following that service will be our annual congregational meeting where we'll be electing new officers to the church. We'll be hearing reports from the current elders about different ministry areas and the deacons and prime time. And then we'll also take time on that call to uh, ordain and or install um, our new elders and deacons for this coming year. So please uh, join us for that. And uh, there's some other good announcements that'll be uh, in Debbie's email as always on Monday. 
So friends, it's good to be together. It's good to be together however it is that we can be together. I pray this week as we walk um, in this Easter season that you will continue to reflect on what it means for you to roll the stone away, step into more freedom, more liberation, less fear, and more love. Pray that we reflect on all those given into our care. Reflect on what it means for us to be good shepherds, to lay down our life so that we can take it up again. And now, friends, go with this blessing. Rejoice. Let me say it again. Let us rejoice. Let our gentleness be evidence to all that God is near. Let us not be anxious about anything, but with prayer and thanksgiving and gratitude and courage, let us bring ourselves before God and one another. And may the peace of Christ, which transcends all understanding, may it guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And together, all God's people said, Amen.